So from the very beginning there, uh, I'm Norman Beer. I am the executive director of the Simon Initiative and director of the Open Learning Initiatives, both of these at Carnegie Mellon University. I wear a couple of hats, and I'm going to be diving in to talk about those and give you a better picture of uh, the kind of work that happens there. But before I do, while I was wandering around this morning mingling, I um, had someone ask about my lapel pin. So I don't know if you can see it in the bright lights. But this is a pickle pin. Specifically, this is a Heinz pickle pin. The Heinz company has been a pretty strong part of the Pittsburgh landscape for the past eh, 120 years now. Uh, they gave these away at a World's Fair. So they've sort of become an emblem of Pittsburgh. So I wear this with a little bit of hometown pride. I also wear it because the Heinz family has been incredibly generous, um, both in supporting Carnegie Mellon, but more specifically in supporting the Simon Initiative. Uh, more important to me personally, though, I wear this because my father spent about three and a half decades fixing forklifts at the Heinz plant. Uh, it was a pretty good job in the 80s, but maybe not a job that leaves a lot of money to set aside for tuition for the kids. And so I ended up at a small state school called Indiana University of Pennsylvania. The uh, PA state system is, strangely, frequently named for other states. Um, and. The pickle pin reminds me of where I've come from. I am fortunate to be at a place like CMU, but I got here because of a strong public investment in higher education, and I love to come and talk with other institutions and systems that are public. It's really, really important, so, uh, and I assume this is a large number. How many of you are uh, doing work at a public institution? All right, give yourself a round of applause, please. The work that you're doing is incredibly important. This is um, you know, one of the most important paths for social, social mobility in the country, and I know this because I've lived it. So thank you. I'm really excited to be here, um, but I'm also going to be a little bit short on time. I walked in thinking that I had 60 minutes. It turns out that uh, I only have 45. The conference organizer said, don't worry about it. Nobody's interested in lunch. They'll listen to you talk all day. <laughs> Maybe not so much. So uh, I've done my best to trim down my deck, but um, I'm also going to be moving a little bit fast. We're going to move quickly. We're going to try not to break things. And I'm going to start off with a question. Anybody find the last week a little bit tough? Yeah. yeah, it's been a tough week, right? Nationally, it's been tough. Things going on in the news. In the ed tech community, it's also it's been a little bit strange in the circles that I hang out in. Um, I'm going to point to this article that came out last week. So John Warner digging into uh, two different scenarios. He's holding his analogous. The Institute for Transformational Learning at UT Austin, it's a four-year program that was shut down, and a sort of confessional from Larry Berger, uh, the CEO at Amplify, about a, a lack of belief in what he had been calling the, the engineering model of learning. I'm raising these because there are certain pieces of this that have really percolated out into my community as people talk about this article. And so, so a couple of things I want to call out on this. Before I do, how many of you have read this? All right, all of you should go back and read this. When I get done talking, um, don't, don't, read while I'm, uh, don't read while I'm talking. Multitasking is bad. A um, couple of things that I want to call out this. I, th I think that John does a really good job of highlighting some challenges in how we think about educational technology, how we think about innovation. But the pieces that jump out when I read about these efforts are first these promises of transformation. We're going to see these rapid changes to systems. And, you know, that's not how science works. That's not how improvement works. And yet we keep seeing these kinds of, uh, these, these kinds of stories and these kinds of promises that say we're going to transform education. Um, these kinds of breakthroughs aren't how science traditionally happens. And so I also want to note here that while he's identifying the high cost financially, and, and uh, the number that he comes up with, $100 million, is a high cost, I think he misses some of the core costs, the cost to our students who have ended up uh, you know, living through some of these efforts and aren't able to pivot on to the next company or the next experience. There's a cost to the faculty involved. Um, initiative fatigue is just painful. And there are costs to our institutions. There's an opportunity cost while we're working on these things. We're not working on others. But I think that there's also a cost in terms of the kinds of promises that we need to make, that when every innovation is going to transform education overnight, it means that we need to keep promising more and more when we go out to seek funding, whether this is to our government institutions and research, whether it's to our private foundations who are looking to help improve outcomes. And so eventually we are making the most ridiculous promises as we go out, uh, things that just can't be achieved, even if it was 
um, you know, well-intentioned. And I think that uh, this hype cycle is unfortunate. It's really ended up being toxic, um, which leads me to, as I've been reading a lot of the commentary on this, seeing some of my colleagues in ed tech, or formerly in ed tech, who have really sort of turned towards a, a view of innovation that is frequently anti-technology, often anti-data, um, and sometimes anti-science, this notion of saying, you know, we're giving up on this. The only way that learning happens is with one instructor standing in a classroom and, darn it, I'll know that learning's happened when I see the glow in their eyes. And I think that this is also really unfortunate. There's a high cost here. So, first, just sort of getting this out of the way, um, I am pro-technology. I think that we can do great things with it. I'm assuming that's a comfortable position at this conference. I'm not going to stand up here and promise you some rapid transformational silver bullet. I think that anybody that does, you should uh, invite to leave the stage. Uh, if they own an ed tech company and promise that they're going to disrupt higher education, you should throw them off the stage. <laughs> so those are sort of our ground rules. Core message, as we walk out of the room, whatever else you get from this talk, um, I hope that you recognize that we in not-for-profit higher education are in an exceptional position to leverage the work that's going on in innovation and learning science and to use it to simultaneously improve outcomes in our classroom, but also to advance our understanding of how human beings learn. And I think that being successful in this space is gonna require a number of things that we in higher ed are not traditionally good at. We're not actually great at collaboration, we're not great at new business models, and we've been getting better at open approaches, but we need to learn how to do better at all of it. If nothing else, uh, you're gonna hear me repeat this phrase a few times during the talk, and you if you get nothing else from my talk, science is incremental. So I had posited when I put together my abstract for this talk, um, is this assertion that we face some pretty big challenges in higher ed. And I had originally planned to make the case for those challenges. In trimming my deck, uh, killing my darlings, as Faulkner would tell me, I ended up sort of uh, trusting that the rest of you believe that we've got some big challenges to face. But what's interesting about those challenges if you look, is that these are not new, that we've had these large concerns about the role that higher education can play, um, even as it offers a path towards upward mobility, in also building a wall towards that mobility. And I think that uh, you know, Truman's talking about this in the World War II era, when we're seeing the impact of the GI Bill, and so the problems are actually kind of similar. We're seeing a new, more diverse population attending higher ed, not diverse as we would identify it today, but diverse for its era. We're seeing a different role for higher ed in terms of the kinds of jobs that it can support and the demand for it in terms of the opportunities that it opens up. Right? And so I think that um, we can look back at some of these challenges and recognize that today we continue to see problems that in part are coming out of the same challenges they were attempting to solve. That when we look at our financial model today, what we're looking at is a World War II funding model for higher education. States pay most of it, feds put a little bit on top, and it turns out that uh, the states are no longer interested in paying their share. That we have an ever more diverse population of learners coming to our campuses, and we were not designed as a system to support those learners, and we're trying to figure out how to do a better job because their success is even more important now than it's been. So these are some of the big challenges that I think that a careful application of science, technology, uh, collaboration, and a little bit of honesty can help solve. All right, so at the beginning of this, I told you that I was the executive director of the Simon Initiative. As you heard, this is named for Herb Simon. Uh, who knows who Herb Simon is? Who's Herb Simon? Organizational behavior, this is really where he did the bulk of his work. And so uh, Dr. Simon was a Carnegie Mellon professor. He was also maybe best known for uh, winning a Nobel Prize in economics, which he got by trying to understand organizational behavior. And he decided that to understand organizational behavior, he needed to model human intelligence. And so he spent some time with Alan Newell inventing the modern field of artificial intelligence. Got to the end of that run, decided that he really needed to better understand how human cognition worked if he was going to model human intelligence. And uh, so we then went on to found what we currently think of as cognitive science as a field. Man was busy, a little bit humbling to lead an initiative named for him. But he is, he is relevant in this case because at the end of his career, he began to spend a lot more of his time and attention thinking about how to improve learning. His own sense was that we have done as much as we're going to do if, in terms of improvement um, 
if learning is going and teaching are going to consist of one person standing up here talking at you. And instead, his argument was that to make advances, we need to begin to treat the improvement of learning as a research discipline in its own right, and as a research discipline that belongs to every faculty member, one that we need to treat with the same rigor and the same respect as research in our own domains. And so this is a challenge that he threw out to, um, to his colleagues at CMU, to build this research community that really took as its mission the advancement of learning and our understanding of learning. One of the things that's interesting about CMU is we don't have a college of education. And so when his peers took up this challenge, there really wasn't any one place for this work to live. When you combine that with Carnegie Mellon's tendency towards uh, kind of strange and unlikely cross-disciplinary projects, what you end up with 50 years later is a series of world-leading projects ranging from the learning sciences with the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center to advanced work in intelligent tutoring systems to new work happening in computer-supported collaborative learning. Lots and lots of amazing projects, not all of which are represented on my slide. Um, but because they don't have a central home, these projects also sometimes ended up a little bit siloed, not talking well to one another. About four years ago, CMU had a presidential transition, and our uh, president at that point spent some time on a listening tour asking his faculty and staff, what's really exciting here? What's interesting? Where do I need to be paying more attention? And their answer was this. This space is really, really important. It's really exciting, but it's a little bit too siloed. These people don't talk to one another. And you know what? Sometimes we actually find it hard to take this world-leading work and uh, have our students here at Carnegie Mellon take advantage of it. And so he, charged, he started as his first strategic university level initiative, the Simon Initiative. So what, what we're charged with is really providing an umbrella over this work in a way that can better interconnect and accelerate it, certainly find ways to use it for Carnegie Mellon students, but also recognize that if this is going to be useful, we need to get it out into the world to have a larger impact. Now, what's interesting is that there's a huge array of projects up in this space. And so one of the first questions that we had as we started to put the Simon Initiative together is, what, what, what binds these things? What is it about this work that we think is core to Carnegie Mellon? And our first place to go back to was Simon's understanding of learning. First point, where does learning take place? In your head, thank you. Susan, please do this. Um, the slide gives it away. Uh, the last time I gave this presentation, someone argued with me. They said, no, learning can take place anywhere. I said, well, if we think about learning as a change of knowledge state in the brain, then it's taking place inside of our head, and this is not something we can observe. Um, I've got a few colleagues working with MRI, fMRI machines that are going to make that a false point at some point, but they're not there yet. And so, if we want to observe learning, we need to get it out of the brain. We need to build a model of what we think is happening and get it out into a place where we can connect it to observable practice. And from there, we can refine our model because the odds are, since we couldn't see it, our initial hypothesis on what's happening in the brain, probably not quite right. 50 years ago, Herb Simon proposed what he called a learning engineering approach. And his notion of learning engineering is that we begin with these models and use them as a way to integrate what's happening in the learning sciences and what's happening in ongoing research with new and innovative practice. So we're able to use the best of what we know from the sciences to design both our models and our practice, instrument those practices, whether those are something new in the classroom or something new online, and use that data to fundamentally improve what's happening inside of our practice. This by itself is actually pretty important. So this ability to engage in data-driven continuous improvement is a hallmark of learning engineering. And if we were just doing that, I think we would be doing something worthwhile. But in the aggregate, we can also take this information and push it back into the learning sciences. And so we end up with two virtuous cycles, one to improve our practice, and the second to really make an advance on what's happening in learning science broadly. So when we talk about the Simon Initiative goals, as I've mentioned, our goal is certainly to take what we're doing in the learning engineering space, accelerate and expand it. And by expand, we really mean let's, let's get it out into the world in a way that is not just focused on CMU's campus. We're certainly concerned with using this stuff for CMU students, but we'd really like to see others engaging in and working with us on the approach. Because if we're going to start to take, uh, take aim at some of those larger challenges that I've outlined, those are challenges that are too big for any one institution to solve even Carnegie Mellon. How are we going to do this? Well, 
um, you know, first, in terms of the actions that we're taking, obviously, I've got to find ways to provide support for all of those smaller projects that I put up on my NASCAR screen. But we've also identified a few flagship projects, and this is where we start to outline places where we're trying to push the work of the Simon Initiative out into the public so that others can collaborate with us and take advantage of the work. Uh, we've ended up trying to take the learning engineering approach in this whole array of tools that we've been building, and we're going to be applying them to a couple centerpiece course efforts to really build these out in a good way and put them out in a place where others can adapt them and adopt them and use them in ways that are appropriate for their own institutional context. Algebra and CS have been no-brainers. I uh, had some funding from the Carnegie Corporation to build those out. We picked those because CMU is a pretty quantitative place. We knew that we needed better work in uh, statistics. I think I just misspoke and said algebra. Uh, and CS is another obvious one, that we continue to have more of a demand for computer science education than we need at CMU. Both of those have been a little bit heavy on the cognitive side of learning and on the cognitive side of research. But this, the latest project that we've undertaken in writing and communication has been interesting because we've been able to start to weave together a much larger array of approaches, particularly in social and collaborative learning, to try to take some of our tools and some of our human approaches and make it easier for our students and hopefully others to get a more consistent experience and a longer education in writing and communication across the entirety of their four years at CMU. This is emerging into something that we're calling a sidecar model, sort of recognizing that one of the benefits that these kinds of tools and approaches can have is that they need not be an all-encompassing set of courseware that's going to come dominate your classroom. Instead, if I can give you a small chunk of combined technology and human support, you're then able to plug this into your class. And it may be that you're teaching an introduction to biology class, but you'd like a little bit of support in getting your students to write some good executive summaries. And so we're seeing this as both a way to be of direct service to the educator in the classroom, not leading with the technology, uh, but also to allow for faculty to continue to focus on their own areas of expertise, but to still give some of these more expanded areas of instruction to their learners. Looking beyond the courses, we've also been looking at technology, because we've got an awful lot of tools that are intended to support this larger learning engineering approach. And these range from ongoing experiments in uh, building authentic learning experiences to tools for better instrumenting and delivering content, tools for capturing all of the data that's coming off of this work and analyzing it, and finally, a hodgepodge of tools for you know, drilling in and doing some of the research that we also know is important. Now, our first goal has been to take what we think of as our leading learning engineering tools, get an open source license on it, and get it out into the world where people can take advantage of it. That's been an ongoing process. But there's also this notion when I talk about the learning engineering process that this is a nice, smooth, friction-free process, right? I mean, this is easy. You use your science to make some innovation, which you're going to measure. Stuff is really hard, and these tools do not always play well together. And so the larger project is to start to take these and build them out into a much more coherent ecosystem. And we think that some part of our work in this is really to drill in on interconnections and interoperations between these tools, but also to ensure that the larger project is open. Open is in open source, open is in open APIs, so that as new tools and approaches can come online, they're able to be plugged in. But also, open as in able to be investigated. Far too much of the technology that's out there, and this includes stuff CMU is putting out into the world, ends up being packaged up in black boxes that we can't see, we can't understand, we can't examine. And if we're going to be using these tools to make serious decisions about what's happening with our learners, we have to be able to drill in and understand what's happening there. Um, some of this because we shouldn't simply trust what's in the black box. But more importantly, I think, every piece of evidence that we have about technology, particularly over the last two years, has demonstrated that no matter how well-intentioned, we are going to be introducing biases into our algorithms. Whether those are algorithms for deciding what color of skin is going to turn on the uh, hair dryer in the bathroom, or excuse me, the hand dryer in the bathroom, or whether these are algorithms deciding what kind of news you're going to see in your Facebook feed, our best intentions mean that we're, you know, not always seeing the biases that we're going to be introducing. And I think that one of the larger lessons of the open source movement, uh, Linus Torvald's quote, under enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. I am hopeful that if enough eyeballs can get on these algorithms, we're also going to be able to call out, start to address some of these subconscious biases that are going to be introduced into our technologies. 
And if we do that, we're going to be able to use these tools to really build out sort of our last centerpiece flagship project, and that is to look ahead to next generation systems. How do we really start to build a better on-ramp um, you know, for, for more faculty to take advantage of these approaches and to participate in this process? So we've talked about Simon Goals, we've talked about some of our projects, and I've obviously been emphasizing the technical piece of this, but I also want to make clear that when we talk about the larger work of Simon, we recognize that we cannot focus narrowly on the technical dimension. There is an enormous social dimension that has to be considered, that we're going to talk about integrating research and practice. Practice is actually something we have to pay attention to. We've been really fortunate at CMU uh, in that our Eberly Center for Teaching and Learning has taken on this role of making close connections with our technical infrastructure, but also in finding ways to package up these elements of practice and get them out into the world. So it's not just a technical infrastructure, but a socio-technical one. We've also recognized that there's an incredible role that culture plays in how these kinds of innovations can be adopted and sustained. Um, you know, the literature is rife with stories of uh, technology-enhanced learning innovations, TEL, in my shorthand. So TEL innovations that showed great outcomes but never went anywhere. Either they didn't make it out of their own classroom or they, you know, saw some practitioners pick it up but uh, efforts faded. Or people just refused to adopt the approach at all. Most of the literature to date on this has been anecdotal. We don't really understand why it's so hard to get good stuff out into the classroom. We have been really fortunate to receive a grant from the Carnegie Corporation of New York to study this problem and understand what are the barriers to adopting, developing, and sustaining these kinds of innovations. And we've taken what I think is a fairly unique approach in that we have a cultural anthropologist, Dr. Lauren Herkus, who has been embedded in our development and adoption teams for the past two years. Um, something sort of eerie about spending time with someone that you think of as a research colleague and then discovering that uh, you're not actually doing research together. She's, she's doing research on you. Um, but it's also really important. Uh, and, and so Lauren has been doing a lot of work in observing what happens as we build this stuff, what happens as it gets out into the world. She's going to be releasing a larger report on this over the next month. We just presented her findings um, at Eli about two weeks ago. And I think that there's some really compelling work here that is actionable, that can understand sort of beyond some of the myths of uh, higher education faculty, which is, oh, you know, faculty care about research, they don't care about teaching. Well, it turns out that's nonsense, actually. Faculty have very strong opinions about what constitutes good teaching. Those opinions aren't always evidence-based, but they're very hard opinions to change. And so if we're serious about this work, we need to understand the culture in which we're interacting and figure out the ways that we want to uh, engage with it and, and change it. And finally, how do we fund ed tech right now? Sort of broadly see two different models that happen. Um, under one model, I'm going to go out and get some small research grant, build something that shows some promise, maybe get another grant, and then at the end of that grant cycle, the university says, hey, this is what tech transfers for, push that out into the market. Um, and once out into the market, we end up being completely divorced from the larger research and improvement cycles that were uh, really what fueled its success in the first place. We also end up being fully exposed to market pressures, which if you look out at a lot of failed ed tech companies, happen because when they have to start addressing customer needs, their focus is not always on what's effective, it needs to be on what sells. So one model for ed tech seems to be that we're going to push it out and see what survives that space. Um, and we end up losing an awful lot of really good innovations in that way. A different model seems to be that, um, you know, I've got this really fabulous idea. I get some initial funding for it. I head up to the Gates Foundation and I tell them that I now have a silver bullet that's going to transform education. And I get some funding. And when that funding runs out, I go talk to the Eolit Foundation or talk to a different foundation. But that eventually, this funding treadmill falls apart. We get to the end of the line and either the innovation disappears, or we're back over on our other track of being shoved out into the world underfunded and under-understood in the tech transfer space. We think that if higher education is going to own some chunk of this work and own some chunk of this process, then we need to think a little bit more about how we're going to engage in it in a way that's sustainable. And too often, talking about sustainability has been shorthand in higher education for, oh, how can I make this profitable? which is a completely different question, right? We don't need to make this profitable, but we do need, find, need to find ways to sustain this work. And that actually goes back to John Warner's original point way at the beginning of my slideshow. 
So this has been at a fairly high level of uh, abstraction. Let me talk a little bit about an example. My other love, the Open Learning Initiative. How many of you have heard of OLI? Fantastic. Um, enough of you that I feel fulfilled, but you know, enough of you haven't that I feel like I can talk through this without boring you to tears. So the Open Learning Initiative is in many ways an exemplar of this larger learning engineering approach and represents a microcosm in this larger uh, CMU ecosystem. OLI was explicitly developed to serve as a place where we can uh, be both a production and a research shop, build the best evidence-informed courseware that we can, but provide a laboratory in which others can experiment and where we can advance our understanding of how humans learn. History of OLI is intimately tied to the history of open education. Um, the actual formal birth of the open ed movement is up for debate, but I think in the public imagination it ends up popping up with the uh, gift of, by the Hewlett Foundation to MIT for the Open Courseware Initiative. So a very generous project back in 2001 that is intended to really expand access to high quality materials. And MIT in this case is going to take lecture notes, slideshows, quizzes, anything that anyone's willing to give them. They're going to put them on what was then this newfangled web thing. And this was going to transform education. It was going to make sure that every child in Africa had access to an MIT level education. Very popular at the time, lots of write-ups by Tom Friedman in the New York Times. Um, and in many ways, if you go back and look, it's interesting. What you already see there is the ed tech hype cycle at work. And you can almost go back and replace the word open courseware with the word MOOC and see the same articles written. It's amazing. Um, Carnegie Mellon has a little bit of a rivalry with MIT. So over the years, I don't know. Anybody from MIT in the audience? Fabulous. <laughs> so the Hewlett Foundation, off of all this uh, you know, excitement and press, comes to Carnegie Mellon and asks, hey, do you see this great stuff that's going on in, uh, in Cambridge? Wouldn't you like to take your lecture notes and put them online? He said, no, not really. That's not really interesting to us. Um, they said, OK. And they left and went to the airport. They happened to be visiting us on a certain Tuesday in September of 2001. And by the time they got to the airport, there were no planes flying anywhere. And so Kathy Casually and Mike Smith were stuck coming back to CMU and spending four days with us asking, all right, what is interesting to you maniacs? He said, listen, we buy into your access agenda. I mean, it's a core part of what Carnegie Mellon believes in. We think it's important, but access without effectiveness is, is actually almost, as, you know, almost uh, useless. And so what we'd like to explore are ways to take Carnegie Mellon's strengths in the learning sciences, in how human beings use technology, and investigate whether a science-based approach to developing courseware can lead to this ability to demonstrably enact learning online. So this, this is what we'd like to do. This will be exciting. It's a science-based approach. It leverages our strengths. And it will tell you whether you should keep making investments in this space. And they said, OK, that sounds interesting. Um, and so this is how OLI was launched, originally with this goal of building online learning environments for independent learners to see if we could demonstrably enact learning. How can we use this technology? 15 years later, this seems like a ridiculous question, right? Like, of course we can use technology to demonstrably enact learning. Um, but it was a new one at the time. And what we found was that, yes, of course we can do this. But what we also found that was interesting was that this gave us a space to ask new questions. And one of the first questions that we found that, uh, interesting was, how is this stuff being used in the classroom? Because we kept getting reports that educators were picking up these courses and using them as textbook replacements. Over the years then, our mission has changed a bit um, to investigate both better learning and better instruction through a science-based approach. We maintain that open access to our materials, uh, in part because it's part of that original founding vision, but also because if you're going to do good science, you need a large N. And we take it upon ourselves to build a larger community of development, of research, of improvement, and of use. That this is not just stuff for CMU. This is intended to be a larger community um, th that encompasses a larger part of the world. Frequently, then, people will assume that OLI is simply a platform or simply a set of courses, but in fact, we think of it as a larger approach to developing and improving learning environments. Um, and in some ways, this is an approach that mirrors what we think of as the learning engineering approach. One key piece of this is an approach that we've been talking about is as learning design as hypothesis, that at any point when we are developing our learning environments, when we drill down into smaller sets of learning activities, we're going to take what we know 
from good design and good instructional engineering, but we're also going to recognize that what we are making is a hypothesis, that a student that engages in these activities is going to achieve certain outcomes, and then we're closing the loop. We're taking the data and saying, all right, how, how good was our hypothesis? What do we need to do to adjust either the materials or our initial goals? I'll come back to this and talk about it in a bit. We also are religious about data, that this ability to embed assessment into our learning environments gives us this ability to drive powerful feedback loops. Some of this is giving feedback to the learner, targeted uh, feedback on their mistakes, hints when they need them. But equally useful and interesting is the ability to give feedback to our instructors. This is just one example of that. So this is a learning dashboard, the tool that was developed as uh, part of the larger Simon Initiative by Marsha Lovett. The notion here is that sitting underneath every OLI course, we have a cognitive model representing what the students are trying to achieve and tying it to the activities in the course. As learners interact with these activities, we've got a model that is making predictions on how well they're mastering the material. So students in the gray have not done enough for us to make a prediction. Red, we think they're still struggling. Yellow, they've almost got it. And green end up being folks who are almost there. Or, or ideally are there, rather. Uh, folks in the green should be able to pass an assessment at the end of the course. So as an instructor, I should be able to jump on, assign these materials to my students in lieu of a textbook, and then before class, I can look to see that, okay, the students seem to have those first two learning objectives, but the next two they seem to be struggling with, and so I should drill in to understand what are they getting wrong, what misconceptions are they showing, and what can I now do in my classroom to drill in on those activities? Or, in the unlikely event that the entire dashboard is green, I use my class time to, you know, jump onto some of the harder, thornier problems that are in my discipline. But in either of those cases, take advantage of having a real live instructor in the classroom. So, true confessions now. Uh, last year and two years ago and now last year, I had the uh, good fortune to be able to teach an introduction to computer science course at Carnegie Mellon using my own tools, drinking my own champagne, eating my own dog food. And so that stunt that I just did to you there, like that was very slick, right? I'm like, oh, you're going to assign this to your students. You're going to look at the dashboard. You're going to just on the fly change your learning activities. This stuff is hard, man. Um, it is incredibly difficult to find ways to integrate into practice. And it cannot simply be that we, we, we just toss this stuff out into the world and say, oh, yeah, change what you do in the class. We need to be much more thoughtful in how we understand how these materials can be used and how they can be made more effective. Another side note, as I will note, I also gave you a nice pitch there that said, oh, I've got a cognitive model with a predictive inference engine that sits underneath it. What does that even mean? <laughs> I mean, I, I actually do have meaning behind it, right? But I mean, you know, you, you're, you're going to walk away from this saying, all right, I've got a well-designed tool, but having any sort of better understanding of what's happening under the hood. And in fact, I actually don't believe that every classroom faculty should need an advanced degree in statistics so that they can process what's happening in these algorithms. But the folks that do have those degrees should be able to take a look, and you should be able to trust them. Open it. All right, so I also talked about two other feedback loops, uh, back into the learning sciences, which I think is obvious, but also this opportunity to engage in iterative course design. Looking at a learning curve, this is one of the tools that's part of that larger Simon ecosystem. Um, the idea is that we're able to better understand how accurate our learning model is. So in this case, we're looking at the development of one skill in an engineering statics course, and the idea is that each time the students attempt a problem or a learning activity that relates to this skill, they should need less help to finish it, whether this is asking for a hint, getting information wrong, you know, needing new feedback. And so what you see here is actually a perfect learning curve. This is a really well-designed learning experience where each time the learner interacts, in the aggregate, this is not an individual, but rather a class as the whole, First time around, you know, they generally need about 50, uh, help 50% of the time, but they need less and less until we can say, all right, they're learning. This is the right series of learning activities. What I'd like to tell you is that a well-engineered set of courseware is going to produce these learning uh, curves that look just like this the first time out of the gate. But in reality, we always start off with intuition, and the reality is that frequently we end up discovering that our intuitions are not so hot, that I'm wasting students' time. They already know what's happening or that I'm combining multiple skills and not giving adequate practice in each, or in the last case, that my model is just so off the wall that it doesn't make any sense. In fact, these are all okay, or at least they're okay if I'm committed to coming back and looking at the data and making changes and addressing what's happening in my course. And I think that's the other part of this promise that we need to fulfill. 
But I also recognize that reading these kinds of learning curves is kind of challenging. But learning what to do about them is hard. And so OLI has been at work building better tools that are more human readable for data-driven iterative improvement. So OLI, quickly, we're talking about an exemplar of the learning engineering approach that's intended as a place where we can drive research. What has it done? The study that we're best known for has been our work in investigating statistics, where we're comparing uh, students taking the OLI stats course to those that were just getting traditional classroom instruction. What we found were that those students were able to learn more than their peers and retain it as well, sometimes better, but do it in half the time. Pretty groundbreaking study, one we've reproduced in a, a couple of times, but this has led to a large number of other studies. And so what I first want to emphasize is I'm not standing here telling you that every OLI course or every learning engineered course is going to give you twice the outcomes and half the speed, because that would be claiming transformation with a silver bullet and you should throw me off the stage. What I am saying is that this is a science-rooted approach that in increments will deliver better results. I have a large number of other studies, both of OLI courses, but also that OLI courses have facilitated. Uh, one of the more interesting ones we've been investigating the role that different kinds of learning activities can play, um, you know, videos versus learn by doing activities versus uh, readings. But I don't want to take a deep dive into those in part because we're time constrained. So there are lots of studies that are on our website, both OLI and Simon. And if you catch me after the talk, I can you know, keep you here for hours telling you about all the cool research that we've been doing. Broadly, what I hope you take away from this is one example of learning engineering, but also a note that OLI continues to represent Simon's larger vision of a community of research and practice. Um, that we've got lots of courses out there that folks can adopt and use in your own classroom, and that we continue to look for collaborators in improving and using this work. All right, last change of topic. So how are we going to scale all of this? And what, what is the vision for scale in some ways? Because if I'm going to talk about learning design as a hypothesis, in many ways what I'm asking is that every instructor out there start to think a little bit about their instructional activities and how they're going to be evaluating them. So, you know, is my hypothesis complete enough for testing? Is the design of the work, am I getting enough data? Is there enough robustness here to even test and support that hypothesis? And moreover, we know that this kind of work is already happening out in the world in small pockets. And by small pockets, I mean, you know, in every classroom in America. It's just that we're not always doing this formally and thinking about it as a hypothesis. It's not even just being done by individuals. Um, you're going to be hearing about a much larger project from the APLU. Karen's going to be leading a panel talking about how this is happening at larger institutional and systems levels. But I want to acknowledge here that asking most of our faculty to do this is hard work, right? When I start to explore this space, what kind of considerations do I need to make? Different way to ask this is, how big is the design space for any instructional intervention that I'm designing? So let's just start off with a simple question. Where am I going to get started? Do I want to focus on the basics? Or should I be looking more for a more challenging uh, experience for my learners? Once I've made that, so one of two ways that I can go. And once I've made that decision, I've got another decision to make, right? And sometimes these decisions aren't binary. We can have more than one option. So in this case, I'm going to take that middle road to see what else do I have to think about? Um, deciding, all right, we're going to be looking at study examples versus a 50-50 mix leads us to the same set of questions, no matter which part of this tree we're going to head down. And the choices keep growing. And this is just a quick representation, right? There's this whole host of questions that I haven't asked up here, audio, video. Uh, this is something that was being explored by a couple of my colleagues. And I'm curious if any guesses how many options do you have for any instructional intervention that you design? Order of magnitude. Thousands? Millions? Trillions. Uh, if you're interested in seeing the underlying breakout of this, the article is in Science, Instructional Complexity and the Science to Constrain It. But a basic question is how, I mean, how are we going to make traction against these kinds of problems with this kind of design space? Um, and, and, and you may see this reflected in the fact that 
it feels like an awful lot of our traditional approaches to science aren't holding up in educational research, right? And so one of these questions is, what should we be looking at? Are there alternatives to a strict RCT approach? How can we make some progress that may not get us into the What Works Clearinghouse? So what I'm going to suggest is that empowering our faculty to be better users of A-B testing, to run their own smaller experiments, is a different way to make traction against this problem. Now, what this requires is a lot of work, right? Now, it, it requires the faculty that are engaging in these kinds of practices to understand how to be rigorous about it. It means that we need new models and frameworks for science, but I think it also requires, if we're going to treat this as a larger project, some sense of transparency, of openness into what's happening inside of the classroom. But if we can get this information outside of the classroom, we really see this possibility for scaling it up. And uh, towards the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that CMU doesn't have a college of education. Uh, we had a keynote speaker who, after hearing more about the Simon Initiative, speculated that he said, you know, what it seems like you're trying to do is make every instructor at Carnegie Mellon a learning scientist in every classroom, a lab. I said, well, that's, that's close to it. What I'd like to see is every college classroom be a laboratory, that all of us are engaging in this work of learning scientists and helping to produce spaces. This is going to be giving us actual results, not just for the scientists, but for our faculty, for our instructors, for our instructional designers. And if we are open enough about the process, imagine more deeply involving students in engaging experiments about their own learning. It's a huge possible world here. So what's needed to make progress on this front? Where do we need to get to? Obviously, some piece of this is that we need better technological infrastructure and support, right? Um, you know, engaging in this sort of large-scale experimentation, analysis, review isn't going to happen with the kind of infrastructure that we have. And as I've mentioned, it's also going to require new kinds of frameworks and a new kind of understanding on what's authentic in science in this kind of space. But I think that it also requires some real changes in how we think about our works as educators. We need to have a larger community of practice into which we can engage. We need to really buy into this notion of what is effective science. And I think that there's also this really need for intellectual honesty and a little bit of humility. Um, frequently, I think we try new things in our classroom, and when they don't work out, sort of quickly reject them and move on, or we'll reject new approaches to say, you know, that's, that's not how I teach. Um, and I think that a little more humility in approaching some of these innovations can go a long way for us. But this leads to uh, something that my colleague John Rinderley used to say pretty frequently, that we must be willing to let ourselves be convinced by evidence. And I think that we're not always good at that, which is ironic because outside of our practice, we're people that are convinced by data. So big picture on this, the Simon Initiative offers opportunities to engage in a learning engineering approach we are taking all of the stuff that we have and we're trying to push it out into the open as the foundation for a larger community of learning engineering. There are opportunities to engage with this work, whether you're an individual faculty member or whether you are a system representing the state of North Carolina. Um, we think that some piece of this is technological, some piece of it is social, but we also recognize that supporting this work is going to require new ways of thinking about sustaining it. So, Hopefully, you can think about this as an open invitation to join in this work, whether this is at a higher level conversation about how we can imagine new financial models, whether this is in engaging in the research and uploading your own data, uh, whether this is simply taking advantage of some of the stuff that's on OLI and adding your own work to it. In the end, we have an opportunity, I think, as not-for-profit higher education that is fairly unique to collaborate in this way, and it's something that I'm hoping we find new ways to take advantage of. And with that, how close did I come? Ooh, I am over time. Sorry, I have kept you from lunch. Thank you very much for your time. Hope you enjoyed the talk. And uh, I'll be around if anyone wants to talk more.